Congratulations, John, on having appeared, I guess it was Friday before last, uh, as a guest on Bill Maher's uh, program, uh, Real Time with Bill Maher, HBO. There they are. He is the author of the New York Times newsletter and contributor to the Glenn Show podcast. John McWhorter is back with us. Uh, I thought you hit it out of the park, John. Thank you. I um I had fun up there. That's a that's a fun show. It's right. It's it's you know it's not academic, but then on the other hand, you are expected to talk about real things, and you've got the um the pressure of the fact that it's TV and it's not technically live, but you know, it all kind of keeps going, and you've got a live audience there, as you know, and it's kind of over before it begins, and so you've got to you've got to get your word in. And realize that you only have so much time. You can't go on for a long time. But you don't want to say so little that you haven't made your point. I enjoy yeah. that challenge. So, yeah, it was um, it was a good time. So I wonder, do you rehearse? Do you prepare? I mean, so you had certain, uh, I can't remember them now, but they were so noteworthy at the time. Little turns of phrase, you know, a little like somebody's as stupid as a box of hair. That was that was one of yours. <laughs> a box of hair was the metaphor. The people who hate Trump focus on the idiot part, right? And what they tend to overlook is the savant part. And the fact is, he is <laughs> gifted. Right. And, Interesting. And, and you know, but we we have a linguist here, which is great. He, his great gift is for both language and gesture, right? So he said well, this- Well, unintentionally language. Well, it, it is improvised, <laughs> yeah. but I would say it's just because it's improvised doesn't mean he's not good at it. He's never thought about it once. No. That's what works for him. No, he, 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 he's, he's, he's as smart as a box of hair. He doesn't know <laughs> what he's doing. No. No, but what, <laughs> what he does is very effective, and one does have to be afraid. I'm not that afraid, actually, though, because what it does come down to is charisma. And the truth is, the people running against him mostly don't have that magic charisma that he has. Nikki Haley, it's, you know, it's like talking to a spoon. Glenn, <laughs> Glenn Youngkin, to me, I always have to remember that he wasn't the father on Family Ties. He's not somebody who you want. But think about it. <laughs> Wasn't it him? <laughs> I, I never even saw the show, and it's hysterically funny. You can tell. But DeSantis has something. Now, I know that people say that in person, one-on-one, -on -one, it's like talking to a kitchen cabinet. But actually, he can fill a room. There is something about him. And so yeah. he's got the charisma, and also he's got the magaism with a certain substance, which I... Trump doesn't have. <laughs> it was Trump, but, uh, Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, in which case, of course, it's uh, um, self-evident, but still, it's a pretty good way of putting it. <laughs> thank you. No, that was that was spontaneous, but I, of course, you go up there with two or three kind of lines that you're prepared to use because they do tell you what the topics are going to be. But in my experience, when you're talking, most of it is going to be spontaneous. You know, I don't use often the things that I was thinking I was going to use, but yeah, I think about it a little because. You've got to get your word across and you know, concisely. And you can just watch some people on TV or on podcasts who don't quite understand that you can't go on and on and on, that you, you have to have the economy. So, yeah, a, a little. But some of it to me is just like being in front of the classroom. I just go into that same mode where you just say you talk the way you normally talk. And next thing you know, you've said something like the box of hair. But, yeah. Yeah. I like that line too. I've seen you opposite Michael Eric Dyson. I've uh, I've seen you opposite Andrew Yang. This is at the Bill Maher show. Mm -hmm. So uh, and now this Josh f uh, fella, it looks like you're starting to be a regular, one of his go-to people. Mm -hmm. I think I am. I think they 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 like the cut of my jib. I've actually. Unlike you, I've never been on it with Dyson. It's interesting. He and I are going to do a thing at Syracuse next week. Oh, you were not on with him. I'm sorry. I feel like I was, but you were. Um, I was going to uh -huh. be, but you were. But I have been on it. I think what I just did was my fourth time these days. I was on Mar in um, 05, and I failed. It's the one time I've ever out and out failed on TV. I, it wasn't embarrassing, but I just didn't have that much to say because they put me on with one some high-ranking official from Canada who is not famous, but she really had a way with a line. She'd been on the show before. She was really smart. I forget her name. And George Carlin. 
And he's a professional comedian, and he was making George jokes. Carlin. It's Carlin. <laughs> and he's making jokes about the Iraq war. And, and he's, the only, he's the only person on earth who could have made jokes about the Iraq war and gotten away with it. And I'm not a comedian. And so I'm sitting here between this one kind of TV professional and then two, this God comic. And it just kind of threw me. I didn't, I didn't have any way to, I didn't know what to say. I didn't fit. Yeah. And so it wasn't terrible, but I was not invited back until recently because I just did not make much of a show for myself. The one time I've kind of choked on air as in just not, I just wasn't fluent or interesting. And so I'm honored that they've started to have me back because, you know, I'm older I've done more media. I know more. You know, nothing would spook me now, not even George Carlin. And so, yeah, yeah, I, I get to do it. I get to do it once or twice a year. I'm, I'm happy with that. You got asked a question. What's the difference between equality and equity? And it gave you the occasion to hold forth, uh, I thought, very powerfully. You want to reprise that? Well, what I was trying to get across is that the way we use the term equity these days is it's a fig leaf term because what people mean by it is we want to make sure that people in this organization, in this body, reflect the demographic proportions of this, that, or the other thing. The idea is that there should not be an underrepresentation, for example, of especially black people and Latino people. And to the extent that there is, we're going to force the issue. When you say you're for equity, you don't mean that you're just for equality. What you mean is that draconian measures are going to be taken always, always involving relaxation of standards, although you may think of it as reconceiving them, but it's always relaxation of standards, with the idea being that true equality must be forced. If there isn't this equality, it must be because of racism, for example, and that therefore special methods are necessary to ensure this equality. Those methods are about equity. And the funny thing is that you really, you really learn about why there is ideological conflict. There are people out there who genuinely think that equity is simply a commitment to you know, equality, that that's all it is, that it's probably this slightly official term for being committed to equality. And they genuinely don't understand, or they genuinely don't see why anybody would have a problem with changing standards having quotas and doing all sorts of things in the name of equality and calling it equity. And so I was just saying that, you know, and this is something that I had thought of before I got up on the set. I hadn't thought very hard about it, but I thought equity is like equality, but with something banged out of it. You, you, get, you get rid of the A and the L, and then you've got this word equity. And there's a certain arrogance or there's a certain know-nothingness in the way you bang out those words and pretend that equity means the same thing. And the reason is that these people think, and this is my, my hobby horse, these people think that what they're doing is okay because it's battling white power. Anything that battles white power is inherently okay, short maybe of physical violence. And so you're allowed to completely change standards and do affirmative action in the, the old token black style. I think on the show I mentioned, what happened to the conception of token black? Tokenism is okay under equity because it creates a tableau that reflects what they call equality. It's a very false, as I said on the show, wormy and arrogant wormy. social <laughs> policy. Yeah, it's 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 for me. I don't know what. Okay, where I well, let me just word, say. Yeah. let me say for the record, I think that analysis is brilliant. I I, I couldn't have said it better myself. I, Thank you. I think you touch on so many interesting points. Uh, of course, I'm inclined to want to say things like it's a bluff. Everybody can see how phony it is. Uh, there'll be backlash. Uh, these people who think they're getting equality are really getting patronized. They're they're getting tolerated. They're being treated like they're little spoiled brats who you don't want to provoke too much because they know that uh, people know you'll throw a tantrum, and so they placate you on social media by mollifying right. you by pretending. But they're pretending uh, because mediocrity is actually what it is, and you know mastery over the command of a discipline or a talent or a job or whatever it is is also what it is, and. There really is no substitute at the end of the day for the objective demonstration of competency. Throwing out the tests, you know, skewering the, the people who want to make judgments is all a, a kind of power play and, and you're being tolerated and you'll only be tolerated 
to a certain extent. So, you know, it's it's going to blow back on you. Uh, and you're in a position of weakness. It's faux power. It's a kind of false uh, power uh, that is built on a very shaky foundation, something like that. Yeah, it is. And, you know, I'm hearing from various people who are, you know, appalled at what I said, who think that it was irresponsible of a college professor, irresponsible of a public intellectual, as it were, to present such an oversimplified conception of what equity is in a, a, a highly viewed venue. And you can really see. The reason why I always tell you I don't think it's a bluff is because these people writing me are not bluffing. They genuinely think that this conception of how equality works that we call equity is the way it's supposed to be and that nobody could possibly question it. One person even wrote me and was, you know, th they were keeping, keeping it cool, but they said, John, you went to a Quaker school, and this was somebody else who was involved with that realm of things. You know, you should understand these things as if it's that self-evident, you know, that it's you know, a certain kind of Christianity or it's a certain kind of, especially with the Quakers, it's a, you know, a kind of leftist commitment. This is somebody who thinks that if you are anywhere left of center, you could not have any problem with this conception of equity. And, you know, it's one of those things. I get, I get so damn tired of this particular thing that gets thrown at you. You're oversimplifying, they say. But the same people who tell you that you're oversimplifying and speaking in clear language and having a little bit of emotion, just a little, will talk exactly that way, write exactly that way about racism. The people who tell you you're oversimplifying will happily write about 2023 as if we're in about 1955, and nobody will yeah. say anything, and nobody in their world will say anything. No editor will have anything to say to them. It's disgusting. You know, why, why are those people so upset when somebody says something they don't agree with in a way that's understandable? I'd think that they could see past it. But they can't. They oversimplify all the time. And not just the extreme ones. Everybody does it. You know, I get tired of being accused of that particular thing. Okay. Uh, but I want to try to make the case for equity. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you're good uh, at In this. the spirit of, you know, the devil's advocate and, and you know, the spirit of uh, telling both sides of the story here. And I think, I think the case has two major prongs. One of them has to do with standards. Standards are relative. Whose standards? And the other has to do with opportunity. It's not a level playing field. So when you enforce, quote, equality, close quote, uh, as your standard, and you don't recognize that uh, both the rules of the game are up for grabs. I mean, the rules of the game have evolved. They reflect power relations, dynamics, and so forth, and they reflect history. Uh, and also that the starting point for people, people don't start at the same starting point, and they, they, they want somehow to make that a part of the conversation. And when you say equality, it's like you're taking some givens and you're taking them off the table uh, for, for debate. Uh, and you're, you, you've got your rigid assessment, you know, you've got your SAT, you've, you know, you've got your, you know, your standards. Um, and you, you're hiding, but, you know, you're kind of hiding behind a, a procedural fig leaf and, and you're not engaging the substantive questions of social morality and, uh, and whatnot. So equity contextualizes the assessment of talent and the uh, uh, social obligations in the face of history and uh, ask us to engage the full problem and, and, and not just the the uh, yardstick measuring, you know, how fast are they running the race? It's not just how fast they're running the race. It's everything that went into it from the way the track is laid out to who had a chance to train and develop and so forth like that. And this little cartoon of the kids standing at a fence where one kid can't see over until you put her on a higher box is a very nice representation of this, of this idea. Uh, but I think the real issue is where's the boundary are you, are you going to include everything or are you just going to like start from uh, the status quo ante and, and, uh, and then make your judgments without taking on board how it is that we got where we are? Something like that, John. Yeah, sure. But the problem is, and here's some oversimplification, all of that is well-intended thinking designed to grapple with the fact that brown people in the United States often aren't as good at taking standardized tests as other people. Really, most <laughs> of this comes down to that. 
and whether or not you can be granted something on the basis of having filled in some bubbles and answered some short questions. If you're not good at that, the issue is we've got to come up with a way of getting around that instead of giving people practice in the tests. And that's where I become implacable. I just, I cannot budge and say that that's okay. All of these pretty words about opportunity, et cetera, are fine, but not when what you're really doing is trying to exempt black and Latino kids from standardized tests because you're calling us dumb. And I can see how a, a, a well, a good thinking white person might figure we, we don't have long enough to fix why it is that they aren't good enough at the test. Or deep down, they might be thinking that we're just not smart enough to take the test. They figure we must make a pretty picture to show that we're not racist, and that's probably the right thing to do. And then you start really thinking about how much do our previously maintained standards matter, et cetera. But as I used to say more than I say now, how would you like that standard applied to your own kids? How would you like your children evaluate it according to this idea that they have to be, you know, put up on a box. Because the thing is, the cute cartoon with the box is nice. You were born short, so we're going to put you on a taller box. It's not your fault you were born short. Do people not fucking realize that the analogy here, if we're talking about tests, is you were born dumb, and so we're going to let you in anyway. Do people not understand that? I am truly, and folks, I am not performing. This truly does insult me. What frustrates me even more is that so many black people don't understand the insult. It's a terrible, terrible thing. The only way I can justify it is to imagine that people just get impatient. They don't want to do the hard work. They want to just make things look better faster because we all have bigger fish to fry or something. But no, it won't. It won't do at all. It won't do. And I well, actually, I, I want to say quickly, I tweeted no. myself on Mar last week, which I do not usually do. I'm not into looking at myself on shows and clipping it, pieces. But because of all this blowback I'm getting, I just decided, no, folks, I do not think it was oversimplified. And I'm going to put this here on Twitter where people can see it, because I think what I said is something lots of well-intentioned, intelligent people are thinking, but you're just not supposed to say it. And my job certainly is to say it on national television as a black man in accessible language. I'm glad I did it, and I'm going to do it again.